Good morning. It is 7.45 a.m. on Thursday, the 7th of September, and coming to you with today's lecture. And this one's titled Hebrews and Judaism. Now, this is going to be partially talking about Hebrews the people, partially talking about Jewish faith, uh, but it's all very closely related and um, give you a little bit of background and a little bit of information on the the uh, the religion of Judaism. So let me start with background. The first thing here, um, and this might surprise some people, the Hebrews historically are very insignificant. And what I mean by that is unlike their contemporaries in China or India or even in the Middle East and in Mesopotamia or Egypt, they're never going to be a dominant military force or a dominant political force. Uh, they are very small, very subservient, um, not very powerful people, but they're going to end up playing this very large, almost huge role in shaping the world that we live in, whether you consider yourself a, a Jew or not, because several other major religions are going to descend from this early religion of the Hebrews. The patriarch of the Hebrews, Abraham, probably left the city of Ur, which was in Sumeria, uh, somewhere between 1900 and 1500 BC. And he migrated into southern Syria, and that's where our story is really going to pick up. When, after Abraham migrates to what would be today southern Syria or northern Lebanon, um, he's going to come into contact with a god that he named Yahweh, or Yahweh. Um, and Yahweh is going to be a god that operates in the world of uh, principles and righteousness, and going to be viewed a little bit differently than other gods in the area. Because remember, we're still looking at a time where we got like Enlil and Shemesh and Marduk and those other gods that we talked about in the Mesopotamia chapter. Before this, the Hebrews or the people who become the Hebrews were probably polytheistic because that's very much in line with what you find in the rest of the area. But that will begin to change with Abraham. Now, Abraham sees that the Hebrews are appointed by God to spread the message to other people of the world, and the Hebrews are going to become or seen as Yahweh's chosen people by Abraham. Over time, the idea of circumcision is going to become the symbol to identify those who believe in Yahweh, and also, the Hebrews are going to kind of separate themselves from others, and this is actually for two different reasons. One is to keep their faith pure and to keep their, their ideas pure, and the other is because they were very different and they were kind of ostracized from others as well. So their separateness was partially by choice, partially forced upon them. Eventually, the Israelites, as they become known, um, are going to go to Egypt and to be taken over by the Romans and eventually you know, be thrown out of their homeland, which we'll talk about in a moment. Now, after three centuries of life in Egypt, the Israelites are going to find themselves enslaved in the New Kingdom. And sometime around 1250 BC, a person named Moses is going to become the leader of the Israelites. And Moses is going to lead the people out of Egypt into the Sinai Desert. And this is known as the Exodus. Now, as a side note, from a purely historical standpoint, yes, the Hebrews did live in Israel, but there's no evidence that they were ever considered slaves. Um, the historical record and religious record, of course, can can be similar or they can be different. And this is one of those places where they do differ. During the time of the Sinai, Moses is said to receive the law of Yahweh or the covenant of Yahweh, which we know today as the Ten Commandments. And Moses persuaded the Hebrews to accept Yahweh as their one true God, uh, pointing out that he had been the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
And so this is where Yahweh officially becomes the God of the Israelites. Now, these commandments are going to um, really lay out the basic beliefs of the, the religion. And it also is going to lay out the basic beliefs of the Egyptian, or not Egyptian, but the Israelite or Jewish ethical system. When you look at the Ten Commandments, whether you are a religious person or not, um, historically you can, you can say that the first four commandments deal with the human obligations to Yahweh. Um, how they worship him and what, what they should do or should not do. But the other six deal with relationships with people. Honor thy mother, honor thy father, things like that. So at this point, this is where the Hebrews and, and what is going to become known as Judaism goes to a monotheistic society, a monotheistic system, meaning that there is only one God. Uh, prior to this, you know, I said that they were probably polytheistic at one point, but they moved to a system called monotry, which means that they have chosen one God, but they still acknowledge that there are God, other gods around. So you can see this progression from being polytheistic to a monotry to just monotheistic. Eventually, um, eventually, uh, the two kingdoms are going to form. Um, Israel is united around 1020 BC by a king named Saul. Uh, in Jerusalem, the temple is going to be built around 1000 BC by David. It's going to be destroyed uh, after the reign of Solomon. Uh, Israel is going to be destroyed by the Assyrians. And the, the kingdom of Israel, those survivors will become known as the Samaritans after the city of Samaria, which was their capital. Uh, the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, is going to be taken over by the Babylonians. And they're the ones who are taken to Babylon as prisoners by Nebuchadnezzar II. Eventually, this part of the world ancient Israel and Judah will become part of the Persian Empire and then eventually part of the Roman Empire. Now in Rome in times, the, there's going to be some wars that are fought between the Roman legions and the people of, of Hebrew or Jewish descent. Uh, beginning in 66 AD, there are a series of revolts that go to 135 AD. And by the time these revolts are over, the city of Jerusalem has been taken over, the second temple has been destroyed, and the Jewish people are going to be forced out of, of this part of the world, and they stay gone in large numbers until after World War II. Uh, according to tradition, the only part of this second temple that still exists is the Wailing Wall, or the Western Wall which is one of the holiest sites in all of Judaism today. Now, what are the basics of Judaism? First of all, um, one, the biggest thing that separates the Jewish faith from those that were around them is a the belief that God and nature were separate. Other religions at the time believed that their gods represented nature. Oh, excuse me. But Yahweh was seen as being above and superior to nature. Uh, he also gave humans uh, you know, control and subject over the human world and over much of the natural world, uh, which is a little bit different than some of the other gods did. Uh, remember, Enlil and Shemesh directly influenced people through like controlling rain and things like that. Another thing that makes Judaism unique is how they saw Yahweh as a moral being. If you look at some of the other gods of the time period, the Egyptian gods, the Mesopotamian gods, uh, even like Roman gods, Greek gods, uh, Norse gods, they're not going to be ethical creatures. Um, like just look at Thor and Loki or look at uh, Zeus and, and things like that. These other gods are very often amoral or capricious. Uh, they get in trouble, they do things on a whim, but according to the traditions, Yahweh demanded ethical behavior and let the believers know what was expected of them. Uh, Judaism also differed from other belief systems in that it did not separate the material world from the spiritual world. 
the human body and human spirit are all part of the same thing, at least on Earth. Uh, the material aspects of life are important, uh, which is why humanitarianism and social service are so important in Judaism and in the resulting religions of Christianity and Islam. And there's also the belief that uh, Yahweh could inhabit a human body. The Hebrew religion is also different from other Mediterranean religions of the time in that Yahweh was seen as a God who actively cared for and took part in the affairs of humans, uh, where some of the other gods are kind of indifferent to humans and live in their own world really by themselves. Uh, think of you know, Mount Olympus and all the gods living on top of it in, in Greek traditions. There are two holy books in Judaism. There's the Torah and the Talmud. Uh, the Torah, most people know about the Talmud, maybe not. Uh, the Torah is going to be the first five books of the Bible if you're a Christian. So that's going to be Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And within these first five books, you find the Jewish history, the Jewish laws. You find poetry. Uh, you can figure out their culture. It's really not just a religious book, it's also a history book. If you're somebody who has ever read the Old Testament, if you're a Christian and you're like wondering why it says so-and-so is son of this person, son of that person, son of somebody else, it's because that's tracing their lineage and their history. The Torah as it is today was written down around 1300 BC and then it has been edited since then. Uh, the Talmud, on the other hand, is much more new. The Talmud was written down, we think, somewhere around 400 to 500 AD. And these are really going to be the primary source of Jewish law and Jewish theology. Uh, the Talmud, it's basically where rabbis, who rabbi means teacher, um, religious figures, these rabbis, have done a lot of homework and a lot of research, and they have written down how they think the Torah should be understood and what it means. And that's what the Talmud is. It's basically the teachings, how to understand the Torah. So without one, you can't have the other, but both of these books are very important in Judaism. There is one other religion I want to briefly mention, and that's called Zoroastrianism. It's a religion a lot of people haven't heard about. It predates... Uh, Jews and it predates Christians, it predates Muslims. Supposedly, Zoroastrianism is going to come into being around the 6th century BC. And I say supposedly because we don't have a lot of information on the founder. The founder was named Zoroaster. According to Zoroastrian traditions, um, Zoroaster was probably born somewhere near Iran supposedly near a, a river, and at the age of 30, he has a revelation where he's visited by a Holy Spirit, uh, and the Holy Spirit's name is Amesha Spenta. Uh, if you were to look at Christianity, this would be like an archangel, and through this vision, a figure nine times as large as Zoroaster meets him, and Zoroaster is going to be commanded to lay aside his moral body, bear his soul, and prove that he's worthy. And once that happens, Zoroaster is going to go see the wise lord Ahura Mazda. Ahura Mazda is going to instruct Zoroaster and reveal a message about uh, morality, goodness, and the truth. And Zoroaster is asked to come back to earth and start spreading this truth. During the next eight years, Zoroaster meets with eight other archangels, eight other holy spirits. And with each meeting, the revelation is going to be more and more complete. Eventually, you have this holy book known as the Avesta. And the Avesta is going to include the teachings of Zoroaster and the liturgy, the belief system of this religion. I'm going to skip this, obviously, since you're not in the classroom with me. I'm going to go straight to the basic teachings. All right, the basic teachings of Zoroastrianism, it's all about moral law and ethics. 
Uh, you're required to be righteous. You're required to have good thoughts, speak good words, and have good deeds. Ahura Mazda, the wise lord, is supreme, but not alone. There is an evil spirit known as Angra Mainyu. And when this is broken down, it's as simple as good versus evil, the truth versus the lie. Um, humans are given free spirit to choose whether they want, they want to follow good or evil. But at the end of the life, there is a judgment and you either go to live with Angra Mainyu or you go to live with Ahura Mazda. You either choose evil or you choose good. There's also a final judgment where you have to walk across a bridge and if you are deemed worthy, you make it across the bridge. But if your soul is found to be flawed or, or, or not pure, you are thrown off the bridge into this purifying fire where your soul is purified before you go across the bridge. The, the um, holy spirits are Spenta Mainyu, Vohu Mana, Asa Vahista, and these other things here, but they break down to specific character traits. It's the the spirit of uh, creativity, good purpose, best truth, uh, holy devotion, wholeness, immortality, and the last one is uh, dominion, I think it is. So uh, this is a whole nother religion that is a monotheistic religion. And believe it or not, even if you've never heard of it before, it's important because it does heavily influence what becomes Judaism, Christianity, and Islam as well. All right. Less than 20 minutes. I hope you enjoy it. If you have any questions about anything, as always, send me an email, and I look forward to hearing from you.